I'm having a hard time seeing other avenues to the same power without begging other people, without it running through their sympathies. I don't have the stomach to try to convince anybody else to see me as fully equal if you're human anymore. I'm 53 years old. I'm exhausted by it. I can't fight the same fights my parents fought. Mm. I don't want my children to fight the same fights I fought. Sure. I'm exhausted by that. And so I'm, I'm very much solution-oriented at this point. And if somebody else can give me a solution of full and true equality that's better, I'm like, I'm more than happy to hear it and take it. But you can't tell me that your solution is that you have to convince other people to be your muscle. The to a ratio. Okay, though. The to a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You're a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. Charles Blow is a brilliant guy and an old friend of mine, and he's got a big idea that I'm not yet ready to accept. In his documentary on HBO South to Black Power, which builds on his book, The Devil You Know, he's talking about black people will have more political power to shape our lives in positive ways if millions of us move down south. There are states where we have 25, 35 percent of the population in the south. If we move back south in large numbers, we could take over those states politically and change our future. It's an interesting idea. I want to dive into this and see how it works. Let's get into it. It's Charles Blow on Torre Show. So you remain on your quest to try to get us to move back to the South because this will give us political power. That's it. That's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, right, you, there's... Is it five states? Uh, nine. Nine states yes. where we're high 20 to high yes. 30 yes. percent. And if we, and you've I appreciate that you've done this in your life. You were 30 years in New York. Yes. You moved to Atlanta. 25 in New York. 20, and how long have you been in Atlanta? Um, I've been in Atlanta four years in January. And you say this is already happening. This this reverse migration. The reverse migration started to happen it, it pre, probably as soon as the Great Migration ended in 1970. So people started to trickle back. So there's magazine articles that I was reading in the research for the book, people writing this a long time ago, uh, particularly about Atlanta. There was a young, um, uh, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, the senator who uh, died, uh, who's part of the civil rights movement, John Lewis, Young John Lewis, not in Congress, talking about people migrating back from up north down south a long time ago. So this has been happening for a very long time. It it probably has sped up in recent uh, you, years and decades. Do you have data to talk about? Like I don't – so no one has captured the actual number of reverse migrants. One of my great frustrations is that nobody wants to study this. We have all these amazing universities, uh, including black universities, including those in places that people are reverse migrants are going to. No one's studying. So to you do you believe that the population of Atlanta has changed significantly in the last 10 years in terms of Northeasterners and, and what, what are you seeing? Well, that, that, that we know, right? So in, in, uh, 1990, the population, uh, the black population of Georgia was about 25%. Now it's about a third of the population of Georgia. That's black people. Uh, we do know that the Atlanta metro area is one of the uh, kind of uh, central reverse migration uh, attractors. We know that. We know that over that 30 years, the black population of Georgia has doubled from about 1.7 million to 3.4 million black people. And these folks are mainly coming from? Well, it is a mixture of people, right? So Atlanta is also a heavy um, a magnet of people in other parts of the South. So it is both people moving into Atlanta from other Southern cities, but it is also people, reverse migrants, moving from Northern and Western cities to Atlanta. Okay, so I want to talk through this idea. I want you to 
perhaps try to convince me as you've been trying? Because this is a quest. This is more than just an intellectual introducing an idea. You all, you want black people. Do you have a goal? Like, I want a million black people to move south by 2025 or something? No, I, I don't I don't think of it that way. Uh, I do think of it in um, the kind of... Uh, kind of gargantuan generational terms that the Great Migration played out over. It it happened over nearly 60 years. Right. So it's not um, – and there was no one architect of it. Sure. People contributed arguments for people to move. Other people resisted this notion altogether uh, and thought it was a problem. Uh, I'm a huge friend of Frederick Douglass, who died before the Great Migration, by the way. But when people were moving – out of the deeper south into Kansas, part of what they call the Exeters, he was very much against it. He did not want people to move. He probably, in part for this reason that I advocate, which is that he believed that keeping your numbers incredibly high in the states where you had them was probably your your best avenue to power. Do, does that rely on those, those who li- move and live in, let's say, Atlanta, to share a political ideal. Like if half of us who are there are, let's say, for Obamacare and the other half are against, well, right, that doesn't that doesn't do anything for us, right? Right. So there you I think in that equation you have to detangle liberalism from black liberation. Right? It's not necessarily the same thing. Black people uh what what I find is that black people uh, uh, one of the core um, electoral motivators is voting against racism and oppression. Right. Right. So there are positive things that people vote for, actually, but they also vote against that. So if they sense that there is racism and oppression in the, you know, in an opposing candidate voting for the other guy, right? Sure. So that motivator to me is the bigger. Um, consideration. I am not saying that everybody should be liberal or or that you can't be conservative. I'm just saying I want to live in a place that is not governed by white supremacy and then let black people have the autonomy to figure out whatever else they want. But we, the political power that we have, is not a lot, but we do have some. In a democratic primary, we tend to be the king or queen makers, Right. Right. This is this is not this necessarily. Gen, gen, generally so. No, you you you're the kingmakers in southern states, the states that I'm get, trying to get people to move to. Okay. We when we get behind somebody, when black mm-hmm. people get behind somebody in a democratic primary, they are probably going to win. No, uh, Joe Biden was stumbling all over uh, until he got to South Carolina, and then those black people. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, that's, but those a, black people were always the, for but, him. But, there's a, but, but what the difference I'm saying is when, that— When black people entered the race in South Carolina, right? Because in, no, in no, well, Iowa but, and New Hampshire, we weren't really speaking. When black people entered the race, no, we so, were like— I mean, black but polling— that's the, but, the, but the problem, that, but what, I, what I'm saying, though, is that when you don't have enough black people, you don't have that say. So you didn't have it in, in, in Iowa. Iowa. You didn't have it in New Hampshire because yes. you don't have enough black people. Yes. When you get to South Carolina— where black people represent the majority of yes. primary voters on the Democratic side, now you have say. That's what power looks like. When you get the numbers that you can say, what I say goes. Uh-huh. That's a that is a that is the but the, if they if half but but it worked because eighty to eighty five percent of the black people in South Carolina are Democratic. If it was forty forty or fifty thirty. We wouldn't the the power of would not be this would not be the same. I, I get that. What I'm saying though, but is, does that not dilute? Do, do you the no, we need to move and stay in the Democratic Party? No, 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 no. I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want the the people who black people vote for and choose. I want them to have a chance at winning. Black people right now are voting for. Democrats, and I think wisely so, because yeah. Republicans have Are shown trash. an ab- ability to kind of, uh, if not completely embrace, to pretend that they don't see yeah. the racism in their ranks. And until you stop doing that, I think black people are very much uh, justified yeah, in sure. voting Democratic. So as long as long as their voices are being heard in a way that says, 
I am not the people you call in to break the tie when white people tie. I have a voice and I have strength and I can deliver a state. Now, they can deliver states on, in a primary. What I want is people who can deliver, yeah. black people have the power to deliver states at a general election. And that is what Georgia demonstrated in 2020 when they were the, the leaders in the coalition mm -hmm. that delivered Georgia for, for Joe Biden. Now, I, you can talk about should we be Democrats or Republicans. I just want to make sure that who you're voting for has a shot at winning. And right now, that's not true for us in any other state because you're 15, 10, you know, 12 percent of the population of the state. And basically, you have to wait for something to break does for your 15 cent to make sense. It, does it require us to vote? Meaning vote period? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so black is, people who not, black people who don't believe in the system or for whatever reason are unwilling or unable to vote, they are not helpful to this that's this idea, yeah, right? I I, I I am not anti America. I'm not anti. No, of course not. I'm not anti democratic anyway. This is no. Uh, you're using the I, democratic I, I, system. Right. I am very much invested in the American political system. Right. And for people who are not, that's your business. But they aren't but, helpful to if if a thousand people who are like, I don't believe in the voting system, move to Atlanta. That does not help your art, right? That does not feed into your right. Art, but right? but the, we what, need them to believe in the political system, move and believe in the political system. But what? But what? You know, groups like Stacey Abrams, New Georgia Project, and others have shown us is that those people moved, and a lot of them were willing to participate. They they you know they uh, registered hundreds of thousands of people. And that's because a lot of new people were showing up. So what what history shows us is that many of the people who would do the who would who would migrate are active people. So I have I want to I want to understand the ideas more. I have an intellectual understanding of what you're talking about. Right. And there's a really great part in your documentary when you're like, look, white liberals did this in Vermont. Right. They kind of like just decided, let's move there. And how many people moved to Vermont? It was not enough to take over the state. It wasn't like, you know, it was like tens of thousands after that article. But some people had already been moving as part of the back to the land movement. But, you know, I don't. there's no hard number of how many people. But one can, one can assume tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. But it wasn't a majority of the state. It was just that all that new energy all at once Completely changed the completely state. Completely changed the state to this day. Yes. Wouldn't have Bernie Sanders today if we had not had that movement from the 60s. Bernie was already there, but it was those new people who showed up who helped to elect him. Right, right, right. Yeah. I understand intellectually the point you're making. Emotionally, I'm the like— The incredulity just creeps in. Right? Well, not—I <laughs> mean, like, I think it comes down to, like, my grandmother is from Columbia, Alabama. Okay. And she moved up north mm -hmm. to provide a better life. Mm -hmm. You know, that happened for mom in Boston. And, you know, I end up in New York and I'm like in my like the deepest sort of black lizard brain voice okay. would be like, that's a backward step going to the set like that. You are reversing what she did. OK. What would you say to that? Well, I would say each family and each person has to consider their present condition and where they think they can they see the most hope for them and their family and their children and their grandchildren, right? Um, when I look around at all of the places that black people, first of all, there's 1,200 majority black cities in America. 90% of them are in the American South. 90% of them. Almost every capital city in the American South is majority black. You could easily argue that the major uh, municipal South is black. I like that. You know, it, 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 not because it creates in some sort of superiority for black people, but it removes threat that I have felt in places like New York. When encounter, it, it grown you feel, man, you grown, feel safer in Atlanta than you did oh, in New York. 
but absolutely. For and you also, and your children. And also for my children. You know, like you, I was raising two boys. I have a, three children, a boy, two boys and a girl, but two boys in a city when Michael Bloomberg was like saying, I can Xerox a sheet of paper and tell the cops to, to arrest, to stop and frisk every one of people. That was one of my boys. They fit that same description. They're yeah. just boys. Yeah. Yeah. And at that time, Quinnipiac was asking the citizens of New York, you know the racial disparity here. Do you still agree with stop and frisk? And a majority of white people in the city every time said yes. We we all the city protested Black Lives Matter, shooting all that BLM, 2020, George Floyd, and then we elected a cop. I'm like, if you were in the streets in 2020 and you voted for Eric Adams, you're you're not in alignment with yourself. So, you know, I, you I feel safe. You feel safe in Atlanta. I the relationship. I think when you have uh, black leadership in terms of New York, uh, Atlanta's had a black mayor since uh, 1973. I think it was consistently, uh, consistently have black po- chiefs of police. It just changes. It doesn't make anything perfect. You, first of all, of course. No, nothing will ever be perfect. If you're thinking you're going to get some sort of utopia because there'd be a lot of black people, that's not true. There are, there are seven states now with 90 plus percent white people. They still have poverty. They still have crime. They, you know, you can't, uh, racial monopolies don't create utopia. So right. just forget, take that out of your mind. But it does change relationships, I believe. And I just have never you know, seeing the same sort of militarized positioning as has existed here. And, you know, as I have read about existing in uh, uh, L.A. or in Chicago, it's just, you know, where the the police force seems almost constitutionally uh, at odds with the community. That's not the same thing. Like, it's just not. Um, And... uh, that is a good feeling. With also, when you think about um, black wealth creation and transfer, you know the people who look at things like this, like Forbes was, did a list of where the black middle class is doing best cities. That entire list is dominated by southern cities. A lot of it is because what's the number one city on the list? Is it Atlanta? I don't know. I Atlanta. think it is Atlanta, but I can't be sure. I think it is Atlanta. But uh, the part of that is driven by the ability to for home ownership. That in these spaces, the bar- the barrier to ownership is lower. Home ownership is traditionally. Why is, why is the barrier to home ownership in Atlanta lower than, than New York City? Than in New York, but you talk about because of the price. The price of New York City. Price, yes. But if I but if I go, let's say Boston, less expensive than New York. Right? Is it is that? I don't. Yeah, yeah but I'm talking about just in Atlanta, I, I, you can get more I, for I, less. You can get, and a lot of people who are moving to Atlanta are not moving into the city of Atlanta; they're moving into the suburbs. But because you live in the suburbs or the city, I live in the in the city proper. But a lot of people do live in in the suburbs. In fact, Atlanta, the city, is only about four hundred forty thousand people. You have more space. You have double the amount of space you had when you were in New York. Probably triple, not triple, probably, but double, double the yeah. amount of space for the same dollar. You think your, uh, I, your real estate I, I, dollar no, goes? I, I, no, I bought for less than what I sold my place here for. Yes, you bought for less and you yeah. got twice as much. Yes, yes. And as far as I mean, I'm such a New York snob, right? I mean, yes, you are. The whole that's world. what they don't know. That's what the people that listen to do not <laughs> the know. The whole world, I mean, like everything you could imagine is available to you in New York, right? Yes. Like whatever I want to do yes. or eat or like, I, I, you know, sometimes when I travel, I'm like, I'm a little spoiled by being a New Yorker because we already have that. We already saw that. But do you feel your world is somehow a little different, a little smaller or whatever, because it's not New York. Right. It's but, but okay. Can I, I'm going to say two things. Number one, there's no other place like New York. So for let's sure, just sure. understand that. But, uh, and so it's such a small place relative to New York. So you, okay. I don't even compare it like that. But also you have to understand the position that you and I are sitting in to be able to say New York has everything and I can experience it. For sure. There are millions probably of people in this city who, who don't, don't they, like that. they get to walk past things. Yes, yes. They don't get to experience things. For sure. And that exists. In, and they should be in a place where they can experience more of what a, the so city has to offer. So if you're lower middle class or middle middle class, 
this is a great deal for you of like move to Atlanta, more space, more your dollar goes farther, all those sort of things. Well, let, let me just say, let me give you this example. The black poverty rate in New York City is comparable to the black poverty rate in Mississippi. Wow. Maybe you can get away with $16,000 or whatever the poverty number is in Mississippi. Can you, do you think you could do that here? <laughs> right. So, so it, it creates a different poverty. The number is the same all over the country, but it, it's going to express very differently. And I, I always think about not like all of the talented 10th types who are doing incredibly well in New York City. I always say, don't leave. Stay where you are. You look like you found your success and your happiness. I'm not even talking to you. Right. Most of the people in the South didn't move during the Great Migration. Certainly not those with large estates. Nobody was giving up a large Southern estate to jump on a train and go to Chicago. Right. That's not how that worked. It right. was younger people, people without connection, people without, not without connection, but without, you know, kind of deep roots. Maybe weren't married yet. Maybe, you know, the, 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 that, that came later. But I'm talking about the early 19, yeah. um, 1916 to 1919, that crew, they were mostly men in that first initial wave. They were young. They were unattached. They weren't necessarily married. You know, a lot of those people don't have the same as our talented t- types. And so what I end up doing when I'm talking uh, about the procedures, I'm generally talking in academic circles, and a lot of those people have already succeeded. So, of course, there is a resistance among that group. But if you're living, you know, working your butt off, maybe working two jobs, still can't seem to make it work for you, and you live in a neighborhood that feels hostile, and you live with policing that feels hostile to you, and you don't feel heard, maybe there are other options for you, you know? Uh, I do feel a significant black community in this city, not obviously enough to the political numbers you're talking about to have control governors and tenders. But there, I, you know, I do feel your point is really state power. Yes, state power. And but it, it not you're not talking about cultural. It's not about. Come here and we'll all have fun together. This is like well, you state can't, you political can't, You can't power. strip the culture out of it. Of you, course. Once you get that many people together, you can't strip the culture out of it. And, you know, you were just talking about, like, you feel like you had, there's pockets of power in the city. Here's my, my point on that, though. There are no cities in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Municipal power mm-hmm. only, is, only exists to the extent that a state allows it to exist. The state mm-hmm. presents anything they don't want you to do. If black people were running Michigan... Flint would not be. It wouldn't have happened. Absolutely wouldn't have happened. And if, and if it, by some way it did happen, they was, well, people would have gotten their checks. Fix they would have got compensated. You would have fixed this and you would have compensated those people for the possibility of the damage you have done. That didn't happen. You, uh, you, right now, Jackson, largest, uh, um, blackest big city in America, they if, have a, a water crisis. That would not have even happened. If, if there's so many black towns in the South now and so many black people, why is the South still so conservative and red? You, that, that's, a nas- that's a national question, meaning like on a presidential election, red. Uh, but you still it, have it, a it, bunch of, re- of Republican governors throughout mostly. It, not Georgia, uh, not any, Georgia. Any state, any state level office. So that's uh, presidential. You're delivering a state. State level office is a governor. State level office is a is a senator. Yeah. Senator, right? So it is because uh, the uh, politics are so racialized. Basically, if you're black, you're Democrat, and if you're white, you're mm-hmm, Republican. Mm-hmm. There's some variation in that, of course, but. It's very racialized, and it is racialized because of the long legacy of suppressing black people and wanting to prevent black domination because they had it for a few years because there were southern states right after the Civil War that were majority black, and people freaked out. You know, Mississippi had the majority, 60% of the registered voters were black men right after the Civil War. People f- lost their minds. They never thought these people would be citizens, let alone voting, and then have the power to control the vote, like could vo- elect who they wanted. And and so the oppression, you know, in the form of terror, then in the form of uh, state constitutions, writing white supremacy into them, and then in the long uh, tale of terror, 
that continues to try to make sure that you suppress, continues to try to draw districts that that prevent black people from having representation. That is part of the legacy. And what has broken it or has the potential to broke it is to literally overwhelm it. And that is what the Georgia example demonstrates. Literally overwhelm it. They literally create a problem where they want to draw more majority white districts. It becomes almost impossible, or literally around the city of Atlanta, because it be, there's so many black people you, you couldn't draw it without tripping uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court into saying, you know, people, that. what you're doing. Crazy, and yeah. also, it gets you to the level that you, it's state, the state level power, you, you can't draw that away. You can't, you can't district state level power away. So whoever, every person in Atlanta can live in midtown, Atlanta, Georgia can live in midtown Atlanta. As long as you, the majority, you can still deliver the state on a presidential level. You can still elect the senators. Uh, you can still elect the governors. Now, Stacey Abrams did not succeed, but Raphael Warnock and uh, John Ossoff, both elected by this massive group of people led by black voters. And just to prove that it wasn't a fluke, Ossoff ran again in 2022 because he had to, not Ossoff, uh, Warnock ran again to the and black people came out again and reelected him to demonstrate it's not a fluke. And that was after the Georgia state legislature went in and tried to everything they could to sure. suppress the votes to more. Sure. So the thing that black people have learned to do is that it's to simply, it's to overwhelm the system. Sure. Because it, it, I want to say what legislatively or as far as appropriations has Georgia done that you can say, look, the black voter population, you know, made this happen, uh, the success of the senators and the governor, whatever, but you still have a Republican governor. Right. So that 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 to me is the is the next tripwire, but, but also Maryland already did it. Maryland also Southern state, almost as many black people as Georgia. And, you know, have black we have a black governor. Westmore. And so, because at a certain point you can just overwhelm the system. But, so, but what, let's, let's talk about the fruits of this tree, right? So you're starting to see. In, in Maryland, you see actual legislation because you have a black governor. Like, and, like, and, what, like what are you I, seeing that you're thinking like, this helps black people. Here's, they're doing it. They got this result. We can do this elsewhere. So what is the result? I can't, I, I, I can't do the Maryland because I'm in Georgia. I can't do the Maryland list of, of, of Not a whole legislation. List, but, just, uh, but, but, but what I'm, but, but the impediment to those in Georgia is the governor's seat. And Kemp. that is what I, you know, want to see flipped. I thought Stacey would get close to it, but, you know, she's kind of the Moses figure. She can lead the people to the promised land. She just can't get in because they, they know that she is responsible for the flip. Well, and so they punish I, her for I, I, it. I love her. I think she's repellent to white people. Yes. And that's not a knock. Yes. I love her. I vote. For, I would vote for yes. her. I donated to her. Yes. Right. But like I and I'm not saying she shouldn't not be repellent because sometimes we need to. But I think they are scared to her. I mean, like you see somebody like Obama seemed less threatening to white people. Right. And I hate that we have to make that bargain. But you see that sort of black politician can get in one who's more, quote unquote, threatening to white people. is going to have a harder time. Right. I mean, I think that the way that successful black Southern politicians run may be different. You know, they they understand the historical landscape that they're operating in, and they learn how to make it work for them. But it also helps that the majority of that coalition is voting for you is black people, and you're not having to appeal primarily to people who are not you. So Warnock and Ossoff, to a degree, they're different kind of politicians, right? Yeah. You don't you don't see Warnock on TV. You don't you don't see you don't see interviews with right. Raphael Warnock, and he comes home every Sunday to preach. So he is a different kind of a politician, different kind of senator, and it works for the citizens of Georgia writ large. Well, wait, let's say let's say you became the governor of Georgia. I know you're not mm -hmm. running, but just as an ex I'm trying to get at. Oh, the the best thing you could do is you have veto, veto power. So now you can stop. But what the, do you want to do? You what, want what you, do you think that we can or would do if we were in control of what what legislation would thing, we see? The first thing that the, a, a governor could have done was to block much of the voter suppression legislation that went through. Very important, right? And it was it was a big bill that had a lot of tentacles, uh, including you know the ability to take over. 
the election administration in Fulton County, you know, which is which is Atlanta. Uh, you could stop that, uh, and I think that 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 threat of legislative uh, pushback is very real. Look, Louisiana when they got their first uh, Democratic governor in a long time was that right after Jindal, uh, and the first thing he did was to expand Medicaid, and at uh, Louisiana had been the leader in HIV uh, transmission and new infection among black people, particularly among black people, but every, in, the state, in the state overall. Dropped immediately because most of these people were getting medication on Medicaid. Like, it's literally so direct. The, the result is so direct. And the only reason that a lot of these southern states did not expand Medicaid because there was a lot of black people on it, and they didn't care about them. And the HIV example is just one. There's a lot of things that could be preventative that could help people to literally stay alive. And See, all, they all they had to do is take the Obamacare money. They, you don't have to do anything. Just take the money. It's simple things. It's it's so and it's so direct. Like it's not. This is not. You know. I think sometimes we uh, the Biden administration suffer from this. Like they do amazing the big things. You know, infrastructure is this, but that's going to take 10 years to build that bridge. And by the time they build it, they won't even associate your name with it. But you did it. But this is not like that. This is like, these are direct, immediate benefits that black people could experience. You could always veto legislation that changed how history could be taught. That, that was legislation that happened in Florida. I'm, Florida's not a target state for me to reverse migration, but I'm using it as an example. Uh... You could block that. So the ability to have somebody with the pen to run interference on a legislature that is hostile, that's the first step on that state power. Being able to deliver senators to Congress, to to the Senate, that's huge because a lot of the federal programming that could be beneficial to black people, it doesn't even get discussed. We don't – nobody's – dealing with reparations because there's nobody there to, to advance it. There's not enough people. You can't just have Cory Booker. <laughs> like that's you need you need 10 people behind Cory saying, no, we're gonna put this on the on on the calendar. For this to really work, you you need it to be more than one state, right? If we all move to Georgia, that would not be enough. Any one state is good. But you need it to be a number of states no, for it to I, be truly effective, I, right? I, I th- I think each state operates individually on some level and then collectively on another. Any state that got the power to prevent damage to black people by through legislation and by blocking legislation, that's huge. I'm sorry. Like any sure. – I, I think Maryland but, but is, you, is but huge. You, but I think you, Georgia you, could be huge. But you need us to do this in more than one state. You, you, you need- I would like, yeah. but I don't think – I think – if 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 we continue to move to Georgia in the at the pace that we're doing now, eventually it will be a near majority black state. If that could pre- that could create an environment at least where white supremacy would run up against a brick wall. That that would be and, and, huge. And that's that's huge. Just, just breaking the solid red South that the Republican Party can rely on. just And Georgia is already a significant crack in that. If they lose that, they would have. we have to rethink what this party is about. Well, see, that, that the other thing is I would love to get into a situation where you actually had to make the people compete for your vote. Right now we're what, what's called a capture, minor, we a capture, capture constituency. Yeah. We won't vote for the racist people or the people who, who accommodate the racist. Yes. And so you have to vote for the other people. But if you're a captured constituency, they don't have to work hard. And they also don't have – if they disappoint, they can just say, yes, but we're not the other guy. So you you kind of have to roll with us. If you break that so that the Republicans can see zero way to get there without appealing to more people, that help, that's helpful actually. And if you create a, a situation where uh, people can deliver a state on a presidential level – it means that people that the the president's campaign is actually engaged with you. Sure, you know uh, Biden and Kamala Harris might as well buy apartments in at, in Georgia because they they're all the time now they because need they, need, they it. need it. Yeah, yeah. right. Critical. And they, and 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 the electorate has shown that they can deliver it. If you, I would feel comfortable hypothetically 
living in Atlanta or living in the suburbs around Atlanta, do you not encounter the old ghosts of racism and the re the South that we know once you leave the comfy confines? I, of I can experience those same ghosts if I drive an hour out into Long Island. 100%. Well, so New York State I, I is know. red outside yeah. of New York City. Pretty much any any and liberal we're, city we're, you're in, you drive I, an hour in the wrong direction. So it's you, all cities. It's the same thing. It's, we are comfortable yeah. in the cities. Outside, yeah. it's, it gets Trumpy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, all right. So you're saying Georgia and New York really aren't that different in Listen, that regard. I, I love uh, uh, Vermont as an example of this. I, you know, it's really very liberal. Barack Obama won his highest percentage of the white vote there in 2008. It gave us Bernie Sanders. Vermont also locks up more black men per capita than any other state in America. Even Maryland? Locks up. I, I, for my book, I used 2016 data. It was the most current for what I could get for the book. It was the number one incarcerator of black men Per capita. By, there's not a lot of black men there's there. There's not that many. So they're like, you pick it up everybody. Getting, like, they're what? locking up every black man they have. They so got to fight to compete with Maryland because right. Maryland's locking and, up a lot of people. Well, well see, there's no, there's gross numbers and then there's per capita. So I'm just, I was just okay. per capita. But, uh, but I just I'd say that to say liberalism, I believe in saving the environment. I believe that gay people should marry. I believe that women should have their yes. access to their full range of reproductive options. Yes. And racial egalitarianism are not always the same. And we keep seeing that. And people keep conflating the two. Like, oh, but I want to live somewhere liberal. Yes, I also want to live somewhere that 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 respects me, that protects me, that honors my culture and not doesn't just tolerate my culture, where I have access to the city infrastructure and I don't just have to walk past the city infrastructure and say, oh my God, that building's great. Oh my God, we have the Met. Oh my God, we have this museum and I've never been in it. My kids never been in it and they, and they live so far from it and their schools are so segregated. Like New York City has the most segregated school system in America. Yeah. How is that better? Like I just, I'm, I struggle sometimes. Yeah. Because I can walk past a building full of billionaires that, that there's some sort of vicarious. The potential to revolutionize schooling in a Mississippi, Alabama, et cetera, that is a big part of this. Absolutely. Right. That that would be a massive sea change. Absolutely. Right? That we're in charge of Mississippi, so we're not going to have the public schools. Right. And, and, and that and also when you have that kind of voting power, you can vote for many of the other officers. States have natural resources. States give massive contracts to do all sorts of things, from building roads to clearing things to containing things to cleaning up things. And you're, we're just not in that game because we can't don't have the power to say this is the person we want in charge of that agency who's going to help to dole out that contract. So unless we kind of take over a state, we are at the mercy of white supremacy. You are at the mercy of begging and pleading or demanding that someone with the power see and recognize your equality and yeah. protect it. And what we have seen throughout history is that people that the country, the liberals in the country vacillate on this all the time. Sometimes they engage and then they get tired. And, and they then, say there's another bigger thing. And then they move on and they say, You're you're griping too much. We tried. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, literally, and they're from Reconstruction on. So wait, let, let, so okay, Atlanta, because yes. you're like Atlanta's biggest supporter right now. Am I? <laughs> it I seems so. like it. I they're, think Ti. Inter you're what? I think Ti. Ti is up there. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> thing that happened in Atlanta recently. Keith Lee comes through, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. You know, he has whatever experience he has at a couple of popular restaurants. Yes. That put that aside. Black Atlanta was like, now y'all see what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. We are not surprised yes. that he had this situation. Yes. We are embarrassed, but this is what we deal with. Yes. What do you make of that? 
Mr. What, what, Atlanta. What, 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 is, what relevance does that have? What, t- tell me just, what, just tell as what you a, think. Just, tell as a, just as a conversation about Atlanta, I reject the notion that black people can't run businesses. Like, which right, right. Some people sort of said, see, we have a problem. I'm like, in 2023, we do not have a problem running businesses. Some are going to be good. Some are going to be great. Some are going to be subpar, just like white businesses. We don't have like right. So, but- you know, it, it just it 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 pulled back the curtain a little bit on ATL. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. I think what it does is that I, I what I think uh, we all have to recognize all the time is that human beings are going to be human beings, and some are going to be great, and some are not going to operate in ways that we like. And we always have to check human beings. You the, by the, checking, but, you mean the the proprietors or the 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 customers? No, I think if 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 customer service is not what it needs to be, you need to check it and, then, some and get people, it better. Because some make of, it better. Because some of some of what I gleaned out of that larger conversation was that some of the proprietors feel like they can't trust black customers, so they're having these rules of like we're going to impose a twenty percent thing, even if it's a tip, even if it's only two of you, which you shouldn't be imposing a tip on two people. You right. can't sit for longer than 90 minutes. You can't, re- you can't ask for, L- like, listen. what are you doing? You don't trust your customers? Right. So that, that, if he experienced that and that happened, they, you need to report it. You need to, uh, uh th- figure but out Atlantans ways to put are saying these, these things well, are then, not then, 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 unusual. And then, and then they need to, I think you vote with your dollars and you fix it. Right. But what I'm the the point I'm trying to get to is this: people behaving badly is not a black thing. Right. It is a human thing. For sure. When when the tenement uh, uh, existed here in New York and down on the lower side, there was drugs and prostitution, and sure. killing, literally killing on the street, and, For sure. and prostitution like For sure. on the street. Yeah. Those weren't black people. No. Those were just human beings. They happened to be white people, and they were doing this horrible thing. When gangs raised in cities like Chicago and, and others, those weren't black people doing that. Those were just human beings. Some of them happened to be doing horrible things, behaving horribly. What we have to do as black people is not apply a standard to us that mm-hmm. no one else is applying to them to say, oh, we see a problem that it is indicative of how you as a culture behave, mm-hmm. rather to say, I see a problem. These humans are not behaving correctly. We need to check and change that behavior. I think, I look at, I don't see race in that same way. I look at it as, as like a fiction as anthropologists look at it. And when I look at it as a fiction and something made up and weaponized against black people, then I can say, these are human beings behaving in ways that they shouldn't, whether that's a smaller thing like how you're treating people in a restaurant or if it's all the way down to crime. And I look at the conditions around the world that create these same sorts of criminal uh, pockets, and they're everywhere, and it has nothing to do with race. White people in white countries have pockets For of sure. criminality. For sure. So what, what are we saying when we try to impose this standard on black people that, oh, this happened in a black place that's a okay. black thing. Okay. For sure. For sure. So wait, in your doc, you talk about we have tried this in a very serious way. And there was the New Africa. The Republic of New Africa. The Republic of New Africa. Now, how far did they get? Well, it, it wasn't enough people. So there, it was a, 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 a group of people moved to Mississippi and they had the same aim. But they, they were black nationalists. They really thought mm-hmm. that there should be a separate black country mm-hmm. and that the southern states would constitute that country. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, did they get they didn't get anywhere because they didn't have no, enough people. They just, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough people. And and they were moving against the tide of people at the time. Right. So people were literally just moving. The, the it, reverse migration had just stopped. So the, the movement had been out of the south. And they were trying to move back at that time. Too early. Right now, the tide is with reverse migration. People are already moving. Uh, what all I'm saying is, can I try to boost it? You know, give people more rationale, more reasons. Did you, did you move to Atlanta and then start the book or you started the book? I and then was moved? writing and then I convinced myself that I also had to move. And then I was like, okay, this makes sense. And I'm moving. You convinced yourself out of the data or was it more of an emotional appeal to yourself? I think when you're writing a book and you're really invested, it is you. Like, it is you bleeding onto the page as the the cliche goes. You're bleeding onto the page. It is all of your mind, body, and spirit is going into it. 
And the more I had to craft this argument, I was like, this is me. This is what I need to do. And also, I'm having a hard time seeing other avenues to the same power without begging other people, without it running through their sympathies. I don't have the stomach to try to convince anybody else to see me as fully equal and fully human anymore. I'm 53 years old. I'm exhausted by it. I can't fight the same fights my parents fought. Mm. I don't want my children to fight the same fights I fought. Sure. I'm exhausted by that. And so I'm I'm very much solution-oriented at this point. And if somebody else can give me a solution of full and true equality that's better, I'm like, I'm more than happy to hear it and take it. But you can't tell me that your solution is that you have to convince other people to be your muscle. For sure. Tell me about the moment, if there was a moment, when you're in New York City writing your book and that voice in your like, the voice is like, what about you? And I'm sure at first you were like, no, 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 not me. And then you worked your way to, no, no, I need to sell this place and move to Atlanta. There were there were multiple things, and they weren't necessarily power related, but they were more related to this is also not your home anymore. You felt uh, like that, yes. Was there an, an one, incident? One, that- one thing was. Um, uh, I had a younger friend, and she invited me to uh, a birthday party in the park. Young people have birthday parties in the park. Central Park. Uh, uh, Prospect Park. Prospect Park, Brooklyn. Hell yeah. And I hadn't been in the park, like, really just to go to a little party or anything. For years and years since the children were in kindergarten, and they were in college now. I went in the park, and I realized, which Prospect Park calls itself Brooklyn's Backyard. Mm -hmm. used to be full of black people. The, where she was, party was, I had to walk across the park, which, you know, maybe a mile or so. It was a, the park is huge. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I might have saw 100,000 people. I counted nine who I thought were not white. Not white. Yes. Black, brown, whatever. Maybe d- just some ambiguity. Yeah. Nine. So you felt alone And in I said, Brooklyn. okay, okay, this is... I signed up for a multicultural experience in this in, in Park Slope. Not happening. And it used to be, but yeah. I don't know what this is. Yeah. Um, and then we they had a you know how every city street in New York City has a block party and all yeah. the neighbors come out. So we had a block party and I walked outside and I realized that there were no more black kids. And I was like, this is interesting. Uh, there was another time I walked out, I came home, walked out to get milk or something. I still had a suit. I had been to work. And this white guy asked me, hey, man, you, you know where the Coke is, drug or something, Coke or Mer- something he said. And I was like, you don't get out of my, f-. like, what, what are you? And like, I'm like furious, not because of the insult just to me that, that he sees me as the interloper in the neighborhood that I have been in for 20 years. Like, what? Who are you? I, I've never seen you before. Uh, but in addition to that, I know at that moment, a few blocks, two neighborhoods over Brownsville, that anybody walking up to any stranger asking that question is now in handcuffs. Or they don't even have to ask that question. They can just look. You know, I'm walking past people on little white kids on stoops smoking weed. I can smell it. But there's no cop patrolling that neighborhood looking for trouble. Right, right, They're right. They're in Brownsville. You, with this part of what you've done is you have succeeded at what many writers dream of, of writing a book. And it is deeply meaningful to people. And you made a TV documentary about it. How did you get from Page to HBO? So my... Uh, book editor and agent. Uh, well, he's my agent, but he he's such a great editor. He, I call always call him my editor because he's the first. He editor. was an editor, David uh, he's, Kuhn. He's a very good editor. great New Yorker uh, editor. Uh, he was meeting with R.J. Cutler uh, of this machine, Director. and he he brought up this project that we had just sold the book as a. I was just starting to write, uh, and R.J. immediately was interested in making it into a film, and so he bought film rights before I had even. 
finished the book. You sold the film rights before you finished the book? Yeah. Did you need a meeting with RJ? We, we I remember um, Zooming. I think it, we're, we're in the middle of, it was not quite yet the pandemic, but yeah, we, we, we Zoom meet. We have our Zoom meetings. But he bought it in the room? He bought it. I don't know. I just know my agent says, RJ Cutler, he wants to do this. And we're drawing up papers and whatever. So I, I don't know if he bought it on the spot or th thought about it for a day and called them back. But yes, he bought it right away. Wow. So that's, this is not a story that the rest of us can <laughs> can help the rest of us. How do you I don't know how anything happened. I, I am like the most, like people are like, how do you get an opera made? Out of I have no clue how any of this stuff happens. Like people call me and they say, hey, we want to do this. And I said, okay, you know, like whatever. And I just get like the people who do the contracts to make sure it's legit. And then they do it. Uh, but I was more involved in the in the film though because it really is a very personal story. So I was executive producer on the film. I'm you know I'm the person to follow around. So I'm more hands on in the crafting of story. But you know, so you're uh, a big part of of structuring. Yeah, but but, but, but Sam Pollard, the director Sam Pollard and Lou Smith, they are like the geniuses. They're the brains behind how to pull this together as a film. So they, I give all the credit to them really. But like I am. I learned a lot about filmmaking. They Ooh. were teaching. What you learn about filmmaking? Well, it's just just all of the you know the particular like which uh, stories worked and and the pacing and uh, just variation. Like the, I love the fact that they don't make what could be a heavy number story just a heavy number story. It's human mm -hmm. and sure. you laugh and some things are sad. You know, like it's if you feel it. And you don't just understand it in a, a, cere a cerebral way, way. You kind of feel the... You tend to make these... You you like to be personal and to bring yourself into it. We meet your your family from your your oldest boy to your mom, right? Your, your brother right. is in, like... So we're meeting, right? I mean, like, to see you with mom cooking with her or tasting with her is like, you know, you... Typically, we'll like, here's a big idea, but I'm going to make it personally. I'm going to put blood myself right. on the page. Right. Well, it's, it, you know, it is a way, uh, I'm a Southern writer uh, at heart, I guess. And Which that means? means I, I think there is a way, there's a cadence and a way that Southerners relay stories. It, our, our folklore storytelling is a different, slower, more granular uh, kind of uh, pacing and perspective. And more of an emotional appeal. I think the, the emotions are part of it. And you, you, f you the point is to make you feel. Uh, I may be overgeneralizing about Southern writers, but that's how I, I approach it as a Southern writer. I always think of it in the writing that I'm writing to the old black people that I grew up with. And mm. so it, it changes my language and it, uh, changes the metaphors and makes things more earthy and uh, kind of universal because you might have that person wouldn't have seen all the things they wouldn't have seen the sea in the mountains and whatever but they would have you know uh, kicked the dirt in the rock you know whatever like what I, that that but that becomes a guiding life for me but also it, I think in storytelling uh, making all things human is important to me in all ways that I tell stories. Um, I always remember when I was writing a lot about um, these young black people being killed, I would show up and I would tell the families, like, I'm not here to litigate your case. I want you to help people to see that this was a person. Tell me who they were. And like, I would really ask them to breathe life back into the person who had been killed. And and in that doing, they reveal a lot about themselves. You see all the tenderness in them. And I think that, that that is where I felt most comfortable is being able to capture all of the the tenderness in the telling of those stories. And and I I like the fact that Sam and Lou brought a lot of that into how the documentary was made. Um I love the calm intellectual family person that you are 
in this piece, <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to the person I loved, who I saw on CNN, who was also brilliant but extremely passionate and not afraid to click the neck and to sm verbally smack somebody in the face. And you brought the funk on CNN, kept it black, kept it intellectual, okay. kept right, made us proud. But, okay, but here's the thing. So that. In that period, it was a little, know, a little broader. Brought the barber shop. They were matched. See that a little bit. They were, they would often book people with opposing views. Yes, they love and, that. Which is not, the, that's not a problem. But you know, I, I'm working on this. But I have had a hard time when people are disrespectful mm -hmm. in my face. Like I'm sorry, I'm a whole grown man. Like that's not gonna happen. Of course. And you can't be disrespectful. And I detest lying. And so I always thought that if I let this person lie in my face on the screen, the only thing that people out there think is that I accept the lie. Must be true. And so I couldn't do it. I just literally, I would. Uh, and also, I just refuse to let you disrespect me in any way. I don't care if this camera's on or off or whatever. It puts you in a funky situation in that every time you go on that set, you are debating somebody from the other side, even though, even if like 80% of America agrees with Charles or Charles is speaking from facts and this person is not. I mean, one of the things that I liked about MSNBC, I'm generally there with somebody who agrees with me and we are trying to get to the depth of the idea and explain the idea. I'm not debating and arguing and we've had the, some of those I, experience, Listen, I don't mind a, a, a intellectual debate with people who generally agree on the facts of things but we don't have uh, but that when people in this era. when people are booked opposite you and i'm like literally i don't know who this is like what did you get this person and they're saying outrageous things or accusing you of outrageous things or lying in ways that you know you know you, i know you know better than to say that that's not true why would you do that you know that does create or did create a real dilemma because all i'm thinking is like my mom's out there like she just heard this man tell this. It's, that's not true. So am I going to sit here and let that go and make my other point, or am I have to? Do I have to address this that go, point? But do you sometimes go, man? I really kind of like came out of my neck at this person, yeah. which we have a TV decorum that we expect, right? And there was, and you weren't the only one. Angela Rye would right. sometimes. Mark Lamont Hill would sometimes. Like Michaela Angela Davis would sometimes. Like, and I'm like. I love that they're fighting the good fight. I also see they're bringing kind of a black culture argument style to CNN. I understand it. I live it. We don't usually see it on CNN, so we have a level of of audience seeing it that's like, whoa, we're not used to seeing it. Like, I, I I wasn't as concerned with that as is as that personally. I've known you a while. I'm not an arguing person. You don't see me out arguing with people it, sure. out, off of TV. Like, sure. I, it is not something that I want to do. So I would always feel physically ill. After right, I right, right. It's emotionally Ill. taxing yes, to do those was, things. And like, I was like, I, I hate feeling like this. At the same time, in the moment, I'm like, I have no choice. Because you got to stand up for but us. But to defend, the, defend the point and to defend myself. Like, there's no, what I have no other option and in the moment, you know, you ha you you go with what you feel is the most right thing for you to do, and that's what I was doing. But like, no, it was making me physically. Ill. But no, you, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. and we've lived that moment in school, in college, on the street, whatever. Of like, I had to go there to protect myself, my spirit, my beliefs, my community, right. and then I walk away feeling spent, exhausted, right. all these different things afterwards. Right. And yet, you know, the people, the black people in the world, that's what they remember. Yeah. And that's, and people always talk about it. I'm like, I literally have been at MSNBC for a long time. But they were like, oh, you're the guy on CNN. And, you you know, and they remember the, the testy moments. And so uh, I try to appreciate them for... Uh, appreciating me and thinking that I was standing up for yeah. all of us, but you know, it's it's is I think it's a, a tricky. It was a tricky period in television, yeah, where people wanted more heat on TV, especially CNN. Yeah, and Fox. I mean, like, I did several Fox P 
appearances, O'Reilly and some other things. And it just was so emotionally difficult. And you felt like somebody has to be there standing up for black people and black. I'm like, but there's such an emotional cost to me. Oh, absolutely. I used to do Fox in the morning, like early, early. My career. So this is probably like 2008, nine. I would do the morning show. First of all, it's just it's just hostile. Like you knew yeah. you were in enemy territory. Oh, in the green room, you're oh, they stressed would go out. To the, it was a long green room. They would go to the other end of the green room and leave me on this side, and they would like talk the thing through. And I'm yes, like, oh, yes, you, yes, you think I'm yes, not seeing you? Yes. Like, uh, so and you're stressed. Yes. So MSNBC, welcome. How you doing? Fox is like, hi. And you're like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Right. But you, but it's like you know, this the, the cage opens. They release the gladiators. You go out and you, and I'm like, okay, this is not what I want to do. So I, I had to say, let's. And I think you do, as you said, you do at some point feel like, okay, someone has to disrupt this. Someone has to tell the truth about this. Someone has to adjust. No, you don't. Just leave that. Let that thing be what it's going to be. I don't think you do have to be there to. So I ask it. everybody. I'll leave with this. I ask everybody who comes on the show, what is being black? mean to you and especially in the context of writing a book where you are very actively talking about here is a specific path to black political right. power what does being black mean to you uh so i will start with this i i think race as we have come to understand it is a complete myth and that is what the anthropologists believe and i believe the science on that i believe however that racism is a very real and pernicious thing that has existed for a very, very long time. And I think that a lot of people who look alike and have experienced the same sorts of racism uh, 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 and have a cultural background that they share and also create culture in the confines of a racist system have a lot in common. I think that for me, my uh, my concept that race doesn't exist and that it is racism that is existing makes me more sympathetic to my blackness and to black people and in more solidarity with them because they are the ones who are hurting from it. And so my blackness is born, uh, and my sense of it is born of a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, quest to relieve black people of this burden so that they can just be people. Mm -hmm. Some succeed, some fail, some be brilliant, some not, and be just like everyone else and have the same opportunities to soar. And until that is true, I am in complete solidarity with all of the blackness and all of the culture we have created and all of the culture that we brought because all of that has to be released, all of that has to be honored, all that has to be elevated in the same way that any other culture would and could and can and is elevated. And until that is the case, I'm fighting until my knuckles are bloody. Thanks so much to Charles for a great interview, and thanks to you for listening. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality. Maybe this show can help. You can find me on Instagram at Torre Show. Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our engineer is Claire McHale. Our booker is Claudia Jean. And we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back on Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down.